one of the important skills as a meditator that we've got to learn how to develop is how to read our own mind. It comes in the third frame of reference. Keeping track of the mind in and of itself. But it means not only watching the mind, but also figuring out what the mind needs. This is the part that tends to get left out. In other words, when the mind feels a desire for something, when it feels angry about something, when it's deluded about things, when it feels constricted, you don't just leave it there. You ask yourself, what is it lacking? This comes from the Buddha's explanation of breath meditation. As you know, it's divided into four tetrads. And the third tetrad, which corresponds to the third foundation of mindfulness, or the third frame of reference, starts out by saying that you're sensitive to the mind as you breathe in and breathe out. And then you train yourself to gladden the mind, steady the mind, and release the mind as you breathe in, as you breathe out. That's the active side. That's what you do in response to reading the mind and seeing what's there. And there are lots of different ways you can work with the mind. One way is to work through the body. When the mind is tired, it needs to be energized. And here the breath is very helpful. What way of breathing is energizing, what feels really satisfying as you come in and the breath comes in, the breath goes out, healing the body, and through the body, healing the mind. This is an important skill, and this requires that you learn how to read your breath, and to notice how the breath has an effect on the mind. This backs up a little bit into the second frame of reference, where you're aware of how the process of metal fabrication affects the mind. And the metal fabrication, or what are the metal fabricators? There's feeling and perceptions. And the feeling here can have an impact on the mind. You get a sense of ease, a sense of well-being, a sense of fullness in the body. And that can have a nice, soothing, energizing effect on the mind. And there are topics you can think about that are also energizing, gladdening, as the Buddha says. You can think about the times you've been generous, you can think about the times you've been virtuous. This is why it's so important that generosity not be forced. I was reading a while back someone, a monk, saying that you know, if Buddhism wanted to be a good world religion, it was going to have to start having some good world charities. And criticizing people who meditate for being selfish and self-concerned. And there was a very strong ought in that statement. And it's interesting, the Buddha never had people say ought with generosity. King Basenity once came to the Buddha and asked him, where should a gift be given? And the Buddha said, wherever you feel inspired. They made it a rule for the monks that if someone asks them where a gift should be given, they can't say, give it to me, they can't say, give it to that person, they can't say, give it to this organization. Again, give wherever you feel inspired or you feel it would be well used or would last a long time. The purpose of all this is to protect the act of generosity so that it is a nourishing act. They're not just struggling under a sense of obligation, but you feel good about being generous. Because when you've been generous in that way, then when the time comes for the, when the mind needs a certain sense of being uplifted, 
that's the kind of act of generosity you can look back on and say, ah, oh, yes, of my own free will. I did that. And it's energizing. The same with the precepts. The Buddha talks about the precepts as a, as a gift. And again, this is why the precepts have to be precepts without exceptions. You make up your mind you're not going to kill anybody, anything. You're not going to steal anything from anybody. You're not going to engage in illicit sex with anybody. You're not going to lie to anybody. You're not going to take intoxicants at all. Because when you do that, the Buddha says, you're giving unlimited security to all beings. And when you give unlimited security to all beings, you're going to have a share in that yourself. And the reflection that you're not harming anybody in your actions, that's nourishing. That's uplifting for the mind. So these are some of the tools that are useful in gladdening the mind, or satisfying the mind, or uplifting the mind when you feel that it needs that kind of nourishment. Another step is to steady the mind. This is for when the mind is really scattered and all over the place. What do you find really brings it into the present moment? Again, the way you breathe can do this. If you find a sense of fullness in the breath, try to maximize that. How do you breathe in a way that maintains that sense of fullness all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out? Because sometimes there is a tendency to squeeze the breath out, and you have to pull it back in. Well, how about staying full all the way through the in-breath, full all the way through the out? And if you notice any sense of squeezing, you stop. See how long you can maintain that sense of fullness. And that gets pretty riveting. But if the mind can't help it, go out and think about this, think about that. It's always got excuses for thinking about things. You can tell yourself, hey, what if I die tonight? And you realize that all those plants and all those things you're worrying about would have no meaning at all. So why bother with them? Or even if you, even if you don't die tonight, it's, there's going to come a time when these things don't mean anything at all. Imagine yourself already dead and looking back on this lifetime and saying, am I happy that I worried about X for two hours that night when I could have been meditating? Thinking like this helps give you a sense of distance from the thoughts that disturb you. One of the John Fuang's students, an old woman who started meditating late in life, who was a very dedicated meditator, told me one time she was sitting in med meditation one night and this voice came into her head, say, you're going to die tonight. And she had the presence of mind to say, well, if I'm going to die, let's die meditating. So she sat there. She had this feeling that her body was falling apart that all the different processes were working at cross-purposes. And as she looked at, to find where with the breath could she get a sense of comfort, well, there was no place in the breath where in, anywhere in the body. There was no place anywhere in the body where she could have a sense of ease. She said it was like a house on fire. There was no place you could stay. And then she thought of the space element. That space wasn't affected by the turmoil and the other elements. So she focused on just thinking space, 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 and she had a sense of space. You can think of the different atoms in your body, and they all have a lot of space in them and between them. So focus on that space and think of it spreading throughout the body and then out beyond the body. And so she maintained that perception. And then as she withdrew from that, she found that everything was back to normal in her body. She didn't die. But she learned something important. 
When things get really bad, you go to space and just stay there with that sense of equanimity and ease. So when you notice the mind popping around like popcorn, or even when it's just not steady, it's kind of has a loose fit with this meditation object. Ask yourself, okay, what's needed here? How can you plug into the meditation object so everything is nice and snug? Again, this requires not only reading your mind, but also figuring out what you can do to bring it back into balance. Which is connected also with the third technique that the Buddha recommends, which is to release the mind. Now, release here has many meanings. It can mean releasing the mind from unskillful mental qualities, so you can bring it into just basic concentration. In other words, releasing it from the hindrances, releasing it from whatever worries or concerns it may have. And then as you get it into concentration, how do you release it from the grosser levels of concentration to bring it to more refined ones. This is where you begin to gain some sense of using your discernment in the meditation, to sense where is there some unnecessary stress in this state of mind I've got here. What can I do to drop it? Again, if it's filled with defilements, filled with hindrances, you can use death meditation or death contemplation to think about it. To bring things back into focus, or whatever technique you found that works with sensual desire, ill will, all the other hindrances. That's one way of releasing it. When you're sitting here contemplating the breath, evaluating the breath, there comes a point where, as the John Fuang says, it's like putting water into a jar. There reaches a point where the jar is full. And no matter how much more water you put into it, it's not going to get any more full than that. In other words, when you realize that you've been evaluating the breath and making it nice and comfortable, but there comes a point where it's not going to get any more comfortable than that. There's a sense of fullness, a sense of ease, and it's not going to get any better by evaluating it. You just Allow yourself to enter into that sense of fullness. Be one with the breath. You don't have to evaluate it all. Just stay with the breath sensation as it is. As you let go of the thinking and evaluating, you find that you become much more snug with the breath. So in releasing it, you're also making it more steady. There'll still be a sense of rapture, but you can, after all, that becomes tiresome. So you try to focus in on a more refined level of breath energy to get past the rapture. But don't be in too great a hurry to get rid of the rapture. After all, it serves its purpose. Wish it to energize you, to give you nourishment when you need it. But when it does feel tiresome, okay, that's the time you. Focus on a more refined level of the breath. Since you're no longer involved with the rapture, this is another level of release. And then as you connect all the different currents of breath energy in the body, so that they feed one another, nourish one another. You find you get to the point where you don't really need to do any in and out breathing at all. This is another level of release. And it's in doing these things that the Buddha says that you are developing the third foundation of mindfulness, or the third frame of reference. So it's not just noting whatever's there and then just being with whatever's there. You train yourself to figure out what's needed here. How can I bring this into better balance? What does the mind need? How can I provide its needs? Because after all, the Buddha said the way you develop the frames of reference is by developing the noble path. 
And that includes all the factors of the path, right view all the way through right concentration. So it's not just a passive watching or observing or a bare awareness. You're trying to develop every factor of the path, and in so doing, your mindfulness gets stronger. Because after all, what are you mindful of? You're mindful of the body in and of itself, feelings, mind states, mental qualities. But you're also mindful of the tasks so that go along with the path, it's particularly the tasks of abandoning whatever is unskillful and developing whatever is skillful. Keep that in mind as well. This means learning how to draw on whatever tools you have as a meditator. You've got to have many tools. If you were a carpenter with only a hammer, you'd never get anywhere as a carpenter. If you were a cook, you only knew how to fry things, didn't know how to boil, didn't know how to stew, didn't know how to any, any of the other techniques, you'd be a very limited cook. And the same as a meditator. You've got to have lots of techniques, lots of approaches to deal with the mind, because the mind has many, many conditions, many symptoms. And you gain release of them, not by just sitting there and watching them, but developing the factors of the path, including right concentration. learning how to read your mind, and then providing whatever it lacks. So remember that you've got lots of skills that you can develop. And when you've, when you've developed them, don't forget them. It's not the case that you go from one level of concentration, and then when you hit the next one, you're never going to go back to the earlier ones. Like you've learned how to bring the mind to equanimity. If you just stay in equanimity, You're missing out on a lot of the things that you need. Things begin to run out. The mind can get depleted. The body can get malnourished. So you go back and you pick up a little bit of rapture, a little bit of ease, a little bit of pleasure to give yourself encouragement. That same woman, the first time I met her, she came out to what Dhamma City the first time we ordained. And one night she was sitting there meditating with us. We we're all in a group. And then John Fuang, who often would speak up to the meditators as they're meditating, he said, Hey, you're focusing on this very cool, subtle breathing. If you do that all the time, it's not going to be good for you. And here she'd been happy that she'd be able to get to that subtle level of breathing. He said, Look, you need to go back sometimes and give stronger breathing, because the body needs that. It needs to be nourished in different ways at different times. This is an important part of using your discernment in your meditation. Not just sticking with whatever you think is the highest stage you can go to, but realizing that different stages have their uses, the different levels of concentration have their uses. To keep in mind the fact that you've got this full toolbox. Try not to forget your tools when you need them.